Europeans and good afternoon everyone. So my name is Kian. I work for a company called Creme Global and we're a, a data science company based here in Dublin. And we've been working with the food and drink industry for over the last 10 plus years doing data analytics, developing predictive models and developing software for all sorts of different applications. Some of which I'm going to take you through today. So, and I, look, I'm not going to talk too much about big data or you know the power of data and all these things because I think, well, I'm certainly a bit jaded from hearing all of this type of work. But I, I will make one point that the, the amount of data that's being generated all the time is is increasing exponentially, and in particular the amount of data that's being captured. But only a small fraction of that is actually being analysed for the value that you can get from it. So. And I want to talk about some concrete examples of how that's happening today and where it can possibly go in the future. So everything I do is going to be based on my own experience and practical examples of how data analytics can provide value for the food industry in different ways. So, like I said, Creme Global is 11 years old this year and we've been working with the food industry in a number of different ways. But the basis of what we do is we harvest publicly available data sets on a global level to understand what the impact of food products is on consumer health, both from a risk and food safety perspective, but also from a nutrition and, and benefit perspective as well. And the way we see data analytics, and certainly the way I see data analytics, and I, and I say this as a mathematician, so mathematics is my training, but my entire career has been with the food industry. You hear a lot about you know, data-driven discovery. So like, you give me this big massive data set, I'm gonna analyze it and I'm gonna find all these amazing insights you never even thought about. We don't really approach it like that. And in reality, a lot of data analytics doesn't actually happen like that in practice. You, the way we approach things is very much around decision making. So day to day in industry, people have to make decisions. How can data better feed into that? And what data science techniques can feed into those decision making processes? So everything we do is about connecting data to data science to decision making. And that's the, that's the approach we make. It's very practical, it's very underground type stuff. And I'm going to talk about some examples. So I'm particularly going to talk about food chemicals and food chemical safety. I'm going to talk a bit about microbiology, in particular predictive microbiology. I'm going to talk about nutrition. I'm going to talk a bit about omics as well. So a bit in the area of whole genome sequencing and metagenomics. So on to chemical exposure. So whether consumers like it or not, all food contains chemicals, be they naturally sourced foods or synthetic or otherwise. And to make sure that those chemicals in food are safe, you need to understand to what extent consumers are exposed to those chemicals. And to understand that, you need two basic inputs. You need to know how much people consume foods, and you need to know the concentration of the chemical in different foods as well. Knowing that, you know what the dietary exposure to a given food chemical is. How do you get that information? How do you analyze it? So go back again. So this question becomes very complicated very, very quickly when you consider all the different chemicals that can occur in food. You can look at pesticides, you can look at food additives, flavorings, contaminants from food packaging. It can be environmental contaminants, whatever. Equally, people's diets are very, very complicated and very diverse. So a lot of what we do is understanding food consumption habits and the basis for understanding that is food consumption data. So we, we're very good at analyzing food consumption databases. These are nationally representative surveys of what people eat over a one to seven day period. They're usually up to a few million lines of data and have additional demographic information as well. So if you understand how people are eating foods, these databases are very, very valuable and are very, very useful for chemical exposure assessment as well. Sadly, these aren't as readily available as they should be. So, in Europe in particular, a lot of food consumption data sets aren't readily available to the food industry, and this is a big barrier to research and innovation because you can't demonstrate the safety of new chemical or new chemicals or new food formulations. So, I'm always encouraging a dialogue about facilitating the, the availability of this, these types of data. But basically, when you have access to the data, what you can do is you can generate a distribution of exposure to a given chemical in your population, and you can see how that compares with a safe level of, of exposure and what portion of your population is above or below that. And if you can do that, you can show that the chemical is safe for use in the food. And there's all these cool new data sources that I won't go into too much detail that we use all the time in part of this analysis. So we use them for all sorts of other applications as well. But there's lots of market survey companies like Cantor World Panel and Euromonitor International. There is Mintel who do product labeling databases. There's all these cool initiatives around people reporting what they eat, like in Food for Me or the Quantified Self, data donors. These are all novel, interesting data sources that you can analyze to understand how people consume foods. 
And we've taken this question one step further and look at what, what we call total aggregate exposure. So the same chemical, like for example, a flavoring could be present in your food, it can also be present as a fragrance in your household cleaning products, your personal care products, and your cosmetics. Pesticides can be in different cleaning or in different like household residential products as well. So understanding total aggregate exposures and stuff is an area that we do an awful lot of work in and understanding what the relative contribution of all these different sources are to consumer exposure to the population. Moving to nutrition now. We use the same data sets to understand what nutrient intakes are like in a population. So this, this is a very, very important question from a perspective of public health nutrition, but also when you're thinking about different ways of bringing a new food product to market. So nutrition is a really, really hot trend in the food industry in general. And we have a lot of expertise and databases and models, in particular a creme nutrition model, to help you understand what the impact of bringing a new product is to market from a nutrition benefit perspective. And allow you to all this kind of cool stuff like what's the effect of certain new nutrient reduction if you're worried about things like saturated fat or salt or if you're looking at a fortification scenario, if you're looking at portion capping, if you're looking at substituting different foods in the diet, if you're bringing a healthy alternative, what's the impact going to be in the population when people consume foods but they swap different foods in and out of their diet, which is a kind of realistic scenario. And we bring in things like probabilities and we use probabilistic analysis to make this as realistic as possible. And this is a really important step, I would argue, in any kind of public health nutrition debate as well. There's all stuff if you're arguing things about like a sugar tax, which is being debated for carbonated beverages at the moment. You can do a lot of predictive analysis to see whether this is actually going to have an impact or not in terms of obesity. And we've done this recently in Ireland. So we did a project in collaboration with the Food Drink Industry of Ireland, a member of IBEC, and we looked at the impacts 14 member companies in Ireland have had on reformulation. The, sorry, the impact reformulation has had on intakes in Irish consumers between two time points, 2005 and 2012. And we looked at total fat, saturated fat, sugar, salt, and calories. And this report was launched last year. It was launched by Leo Varadkar, who was Minister for Health at the time, and it was a big endorsement to this method. And we analyzed over 600 products in this analysis. One of the top line takeaways from this is that if the entire food industry followed the trends of what these 14 companies were doing, the average intake of salt, and this is only one result of many, amongst adults and teenagers can be reduced by up to 45%. So this shows that reformulation can have a demonstrable impact on nutrient intakes in a population. It's very, very key in terms of public health nutrition and in terms of combating obesity. And this type of analysis, I would argue, it should be at the cornerstone of any of these debates because it's a very, very emotive political issue. But hard data is, I say this as a mathematician, un unarguable if done correctly. Okay, shifting again more back to food safety um, and into an area of predictor, predictive bi microbiology, which is a, a topic very dear to my own heart. Um, when companies bring a new product to market, they do have to, they have to show that they're safe and they have to test them for shelf lives, for their shelf life. And they do things called challenge studies, which is where they challenge their product to see how long it's going to last on its shelf. And when they do that, they challenge it with like a cocktail of things like yeasts and molds and lactic acid bacteria and pathogens, things that cause a product to spoil. And then they, they do their experiment, they have some parameters, and then they just log in the database. People have been doing this for decades, and there's loads of data just sitting there. And I've been presented in lots of cases with, just here's some data, can you do something with it? And the answer is usually, yes, it is. So when you take it through this usual kind of data science application, or techniques where you, you, know, you, you analyze your raw data, usually reformat it, you do a statistical analysis of the data set, you check it, you develop a predictive model, you analyze it for sensitivity and specificity, which is telling you how well it's behaving. And if all that works well, you can put it into a software application that the company can use then for their own routine product development. So this is just one example of many that we did for a very large beverage manufacturer. And it's a predictive model that for a given set of preservatives in a beverage that can be carbonated or not, what's the probability that's going to be shelf stable? So when somebody is in R&D and they're trying to innovate, but they, they want a bit of independence from the people in food safety, they can use a predictive model like this to screen possible candid, um, candidate formulations and understand, you know, is this one likely to be safe or not? So, and it also saves the amount of experimental data that you have to generate, and it means you save a lot of money and you get your product to market faster. So this is a real concrete example of how predictive modeling adds a lot of value. 
And this isn't new stuff. This, this, this domain, predictive microbiology, is about 100 years old. They just never called it data science and made it a, a sexy, trendy thing. But it's, it's, it's still finding value all the time. Lastly, but not leastly at all, I want to talk a bit about this whole next generation sequencing technologies. And it was nice that I was introduced by Jens because he's a partner in the project I'm about to talk about, which is called the SAFE project. So SAFE stands for the Sequencing Alliance for Food Environments, and it's a three-year project that started in January of this year in collaboration with UCD Centre for Food Safety. Our principal investigator is uh, Professor Seamus Fanning. We've got five postdoc researchers, and we've got ourselves, Prem Global, and we've six industry partners uh, participating. So, like I said, it's coordinated by Food for Health Ireland, and they were brilliant in campaigning and putting this project together. It's funded by Enterprise Ireland through their Innovation Partnership Programme, and I think this is the largest IPP project that's ever been funded in the history of the state. No? True? Yes. So we're very proud that they've seen the importance of these technologies that I'm going to talk a bit more about in a sec. Four of the companies that are participating are Kerry, Glanbia, Dairy Gold, and Me Johnson. They're powdered infant formula grade. Uh, dairy companies and so they're very very interested in the safety of their products. We've got nutrition supplies who make very precision, precisely formulated nutrient formulations that they sell onto consumer product companies and we've got Dawn Farm Foods who's the biggest producer of ready to eat meats in Europe. What we're doing is a thing called molecular surveillance. So rather than just swapping for bacteria in different parts of a manufacturing environment, culturing them in a petri dish and seeing what grows and seeing what's there or not, we're going to a lot more detail. So we're using two techniques. We're using whole genome sequencing to look at what bugs are there and if they are there, what are their traits. So what can we understand about them by sequencing their, their DNA and getting an actual DNA fingerprint of the specific bugs that are in your facility. And that's very, very important if there's an outbreak because they often trace them back now and the FDA in the US have so shut down Full, full food production facilities using this technology. The other thing we're doing is we're looking at um, the microbiome or the met using metagenomics. So that means we're looking at the complete bacterial ecology of all the different bugs that live in parts of the manufacturing facility. So you might hear a lot about the gut microbiome. This whole thing is very trendy. We're doing it in the food facilities. And it's really important to see how these two things are interrelated. So we know from some very good studies that the microbiome, the whole bacterial environment, influences whether pathogens are present or not. So understanding the relationship between these two is of key importance. And what we're going to do is understand how the microbiome and different bugs move across the facility. We're going to be monitoring it over two years in five different locations in amongst the partners in the project. So we're a cloud computing company. Everything we do, we, every software development project that we do is deployed on the cloud. So all this data that we're going to gather in this project, from the sampling plan, the whole genome sequencing data, the metagenomic data, is going to go onto a cloud computing application at the end that the different companies can use to manage to understand what bugs are living in their facility. So whole genome sequencing data can tell you things like, you know, is this particular bug going to be antimicrobial resistant? Is it going to be thermal resistant? Is it particularly virulent? Is it likely to make people sick? All this information that they don't have at the moment can be dashboarded and provided on a day-to-day -day kind of operation basis and very, very valuable kind of insight to what's happening in their facility. Equally, the, the microbiome tells you the composition of all the different bacterial species that live in your facility. So again, understanding what's happening here is of, of, of key importance. Finally, I just want to finish briefly on technology. So we do loads of data analytics projects. How do we do it ourselves? Um, and no toolbox existed for us to be able to do this, so we had to build our own. So we built something we needed, and that, that, that we needed, and that thing is called expert models. So this is our, our data analytics platform that we use to develop, manage data, deploy um, cloud-based applications that implement all of these different models. And this, this software application brings us back to our, our kind of triangle, our, our approach to data science, which is connecting data with data science and decision makers in a useful kind of triangle of, of, of value, if you like. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if anyone's interested, we have a stand at Stand 44 if you want to come talk to us.